So in this video, we're going to go over Fraunhofer diffraction, which is sort of the oh, Fraunhofer diffraction, which is the most simple form of diffraction in Fourier optics. And we're going to go over exactly what the assumptions are underlying it and why we might want to use it. So what, first of all, what's the point of Fraunhofer diffraction? Well, if we've got some slit pattern, so say we've got these three slits of different sizes and different distances, so maybe this slit is distant this slit is size a1 a2 a3 and there's some distance apart from each other uh, we may not know what these distances are in general uh, d1 d2 and we're illuminating this slit pattern uh, with a plane wave so it's got some wavelength lambda or equivalently some wave number k and this plane wave is propagating in the z direction so in phasor notation we can write this plane wave like e to the minus i k z, ignoring the amplitude or assuming the amplitude is unity. And we want to know in general what the electric field profile looks like. Uh, so let's say e of x, y, and z on the right hand side of these slits. So after our plane wave hits these slits, uh, and let me erase these uh, dimensions. After the plane wave hits these slits, we sort of know that it's gonna diffract outwards uh, it's going to diffract outwards from each of these slits. Uh, we can just use Huygens' principle to make that sort of qualitative uh, statement. But we want to know what the pattern is going to look like at some distance far away. So this is some screen uh, placed very far away from all these slits. And so Fraunhofer diffraction is really cool because it allows us to figure out not just what the diffraction pattern is for a single slit or a set of periodically spaced slits, uh, but really any number of slits, any pattern of slits. So I've drawn three here, um, but maybe we had maybe we had just one slit, maybe we had 10 slits. Uh, maybe instead of slits, uh, we've got some semi-opaque region here and some maybe some opaque region here. Uh, so Fraunhofer diffraction is extremely general, uh, but for now let's just focus on a single slit. So let's say that we have one slit of some finite size. Let's call the, the slits width A. So to figure out what the pattern is on the screen, we can use Huygens principle. So we can say, well, I'm gonna treat this slit like a bunch of really, really tiny point sources. Uh, each of those point sources is gonna be a distance, let's say dx away from each other. So this is gonna be our x direction. And we know each of these sources is gonna be emitting spherical waves from their center. So they're each emitting spherical waves. And those spherical waves are just proportional to e to the minus j k r, where r is the radial distance away from the source, divided by r. And there's some proportionality constant out front, but we're not gonna worry about that for now. We're gonna try and figure that out after we do all of our, after we figure out what the pattern is. So maybe the pattern looks something like this. Uh, but after we figure out what the pattern is, then we can figure out sort of how do we properly normalize that pattern. And so we want to sum up the contributions from this point source and this point source and this point source. And we want those point sources to be infinitely small. So in the limit, as the sources become infinitely small, we're just taking an integral. So we're integrating this e to the minus j k r over r pattern. And actually, let's let's make these r's the same, uh, the same r because they're both the radial distance away from each one of those point sources. And in this case, we're integrating it from, uh, let's say that x equals zero is here and x equals a is here. So we're integrating this from zero to a. And so now all we really have to do is set up our coordinates properly. So we we understand conceptually that each. Uh, each tiny piece of this slit is emanating spherical waves. Now we need to just properly set up the integral. So let's focus on just one point source. Uh, and let's say this point source is a distance x away from this, uh, from this slit. So this is uh, going to be, this one point source is going to be what we're going to be focusing on right now, just so we can set up our coordinates. And we're going to be interested in some point on the screen. Uh, so it might be the origin, it might be somewhere up top, uh, but it's some point away, it's some point on the screen. Uh, and so we call this our origin zero. So let's call this distance here, uh, let's call this x, uh, what, xs, so let's, let's call it xs for the screen. 
and this distance, the distance to the slit, let's call this D. And this distance here is R. So from the particular point source that we're interested in to a particular point on the screen that we're interested in. And if we can figure out what, uh, if we can set up the integral for this, then we can just integrate over all possible uh, positions. So what is this distance R? Well, uh, we just have a right triangle right here. And so it's just this distance. So this is XS minus X. Uh, so it's this distance squared plus this distance D squared. So R is just the square root. This is just Pythagorean's theorem xs minus x squared plus d squared. So x is the variable that we're interested in. Everything else is going to be treated as a constant for the integration. Now at this point you might say, well, we're done. All we need to do is plug in r and integrate and we'll be, we'll be all good. Uh, the problem is that this integral, as far as I know, can't be done. So you try and plug it into Mathematica and it'll just cry a little bit uh, and it'll spit you back the, the same thing that you asked for. So we need to find an approximation if we want a closed form solution for what the uh, electric field is gonna look like on the screen. And so let's rearrange this uh, R equation a little cleverly. So let's factor out a D and then we have one plus XS minus X squared over D squared. And the first approximation we're going to make is called the paraxial approximation, also known as the small angle approximation, uh, or equivalently that this term, this xs minus x squared over d squared, this is small. So this is some small number epsilon. And so if we do that, we can Taylor series expand. Oh, uh, we can Taylor series expand this square root so that r is now just approximately uh, d times 1 plus 1 half epsilon, that's just binomial expansion, uh, which is just equal to d plus uh, one half times this xs minus x squared divided by d. And so the d out front canceled with one of the d's in this d squared term. So now let's just plug this back into our integral and see where we go from there. So now we've got zero to a and we're just replacing r, so e to the minus jkd, uh, so that's replacing this term, times e to the minus one half j uh, xs minus x squared over d. Well, let's put a k out front. Uh, and then we're dividing by r or d plus one half uh, x minus xs squared over d. Okay, cool. Uh, but can we do better than this? So can we, can we make even more approximations to make this less ugly? Well, in the denominator, uh, we can, we said that this was, this term was just epsilon. This was some small number. So if we have some error in the de denominator, let's say, I don't know, maybe epsilon is like 0.01d, for example, or epsilon is uh, 0.01 in this case. So it's, it doesn't have units of length. Or no, just kidding. As it's written here, it does. Uh, so let's say that this is a small number. And so we've got 1%, maybe we've got 1% error in the denominator. Uh, that's going to lead to an overall roughly 1% error in our final answer. And that's no big deal. Uh, so really we can get rid of this, uh, get rid of this term entirely and just leave this denominator as D. And so we can actually factor it out of the integral altogether. Um, but we can't do the same thing for this phase term uh, because we're multiplying by this very large number K. So even if epsilon was only 0.01d different, uh, kd might be different by maybe several pi. So if kd was different only by pi, then we'd get uh, this number inside would be negative instead of positive. And then we'd just completely screw everything up. So just because we have a small epsilon doesn't mean we can make the same approximation in this uh, phase term or this exponential. And so make, let's, let's make this integral a little prettier. Uh, we can pull out this e to the minus jkd term because that's not a function of x, e to the minus jkd. And let's move this, this guy down in front of the integral. So e to the minus one half jk uh, xs minus x squared over d. And then we're integrating over x. And so at this point, we've actually found a really important result. Uh, this thing here, this is called the Fresnel integral. 
And so this will be going over in future videos on uh, Fresnel diffraction. But this is, uh, we've only made one assumption and that's the paraxial approximation. And you can actually use this integral uh, to sort of figure out inter at intermediate points what your, uh, what your electromagnetic field looks like if you have a, a slit of length A, where this is the overall wave vector length K. Uh, and so you can use trigonometry to figure out what kx is in terms of k. Uh, in this case, if we call this angle theta, kx is just going to be, what, uh, k times sine of theta. So we're going to assume that the total slit distance a is much less than xs, or our observation distance away from the screen. In other words, uh, x is much less than xs because x is always going to be less than a for this for this integral to work out. So this term, this xs minus x squared over d, uh, we can just expand this. So xs squared minus two xs xd minus, or sorry, there's no there's no xd there, just x minus x squared all divided by d. And so we're just going to ignore this term. So we're going to ignore this minus x squared, and we're going to leave these two intact. So we've got an xs and a minus 2xs times x. Oh, sorry, actually, this should be a plus x squared, not a minus x squared. And so let's plug in this now into the integral. Uh, so if we pull out the xs squared term, we'll have e to the minus jkd, e to the minus jk xs squared over d. Uh, and then this is all over d. And then we're integrating now e to the plus jk xs times x over d, dx, from 0 to a. Now the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a substitution kx is equal to k times xs over d. And this is just taking the x component of the plane wave hitting the screen. So if I've got a... And, let, let me just illustrate this real quick. So let's say that xs is equal to zero. And so our point source is just propagating straight along this axis. Then our plane wave is hitting the screen with all points are hitting the screen at the same time. And so the k vector uh, is just equal to, just has a z component. So is equal to kz, or is equal to k times z. But if our plane wave is slitting, hitting slightly off axis, then our k vector is pointing in this direction, and it's got some z component, kz, but it's also got an x component, kx. And so this is where we get the name Fourier optics, because we are just taking, uh, in the far field at least, or if we assume that our diffraction is Fraunhofer diffraction, we just get a Fourier transform of our aperture function. And so this aperture function, I'm going to go over in the next video, but this can really be anything we want. Uh, this doesn't just have to be uh, of magnitude zero or one. This could be something much more interesting. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a like below and subscribe to my channel. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, also feel free to post those down below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks.